Back in the year 2000, Roy Fielding came up with a cool new idea to design web services called the REST model. Since then, RESTful web services have become the industry standard for building modern web applications and services. Knowing how to properly design a REST API is one of the most important skills a software developer could have. And there are certain levels of maturity you can reach when designing the REST APIs. Level 3 corresponds to a truly RESTful API according to Fielding's definition. In practice, many published web APIs fall somewhere around level 1 or 2. Reaching level 2 takes practice, but it will certainly pay off if you want to build high-quality, reliable and scalable REST APIs. And we'll see why reaching level 3 is not really feasible in the real world. A REST API should be RESTful and stateless, not restless and stateful. But what does stateless actually mean? In a distributed environment, stateless means that a client request is not bound to a specific server. So, the servers don't maintain any state with the clients. Therefore, the client is free to interact with any server in a load balanced fashion without being tied to a specific server. In a single server environment, stateless means that the server can process any request without any knowledge of the previous requests from a certain client. So why is this important? First, this makes the API more scalable as requests can be processed by any available server without relying on a specific state from the server. Also, this makes the API more available. If a web server fails, then incoming requests can be routed to another instance while the failed server is restarted with no bad effects on the client application. There are advantages even on a single instance environment. For instance, a stateless API can be more easily cached and optimized. This is because the same response can be returned for identical requests without needing to store any state information on the server. This can improve performance and reduce server load even if only one server is being used. Also, since there is no need to set up complex session state or context information, the API becomes more modular, so easier to maintain or test. Now, the server can be tested in isolation. Ok, so the advantages of a stateless API are pretty clear, but what if we need to store state on the application? And most of the time, we'll need to store some state to make progress with the request and get some work done. For instance, we may need to maintain the state of a shopping cart for an e-commerce website. The client may need to add, remove or modify items in the shopping cart as they navigate through the website. In this case, the server needs to maintain some state information in order to ensure that the correct items are being added or removed from the cart and the appropriate quantities and prices are being calculated. To make this app stateless, we can apply the following three steps. First, we need to identify the state of the application, so the data that is currently being stored or managed by the application. In this case, we have item names, quantities and prices. Next, instead of storing the state within the application, we need to store it externally, for example in a database or in a cache. This ensures that the app doesn't rely on any internal state and can operate independently. And third, the client would need to include a session ID or cookie in subsequent requests to ensure that the application is accessing the correct card. So we use unique identifiers to get the state of the card instead of utilizing user-specific information to keep track of the state. This technique ensures that any interaction with the application can be identified and the state can be retrieved accordingly from any server and without prior information. While this approach involves maintaining some state information on the backend, the API is designed to be stateless and therefore we can make use of the advantages it provides. So, the complete definition of a stateless REST API is when each client request contains all the necessary information needed to process the request and the server doesn't maintain any session state or context information between the requests. A good API design is organized around resources, for example customers or orders, and not actions or verbs. For instance, endpoints like create order should be avoided. But why is this poor design? First, because we have the HTTP protocol that brings the action. We have the HTTP methods or verbs 
get, post, put, patch, and delete to handle the actions. This way, we can provide consistency between different endpoints. And when we have consistency, clients can make assumptions about the behavior of an API based on their prior knowledge of the HTTP protocol. For instance, to create an order, we can use the post or put methods on the order resource instead of making up different names to achieve the same functionality. Moreover, HTTP verbs can be mapped to the crude operations of a database. Get means read, post means create, put and patch means update, and delete is delete. That's all nice and pretty, but in the real world, we have more complex use cases as well. For instance, how do we model an endpoint that returns the orders made by a customer, but allows us to sort by an attribute and also to paginate the result? Here, we have one-to-many relationship, and this could be represented using path parameters. However, we can improve this API. First, entities are often grouped together into collections, for example, orders or customers. Basically, we organize the resources as hierarchies, which makes the API more intuitive. And in general, it helps to use plural nouns for URIs to reference collections. This provides consistent naming for when we need to get all the customers or only a particular customer. Then, to identify a specific user, we can use parameterized URIs. Path parameters are generally recommended when you need to specify the identity or the key of a specific resource being accessed or modified as opposed to query parameters. Then, tip number three is to avoid resource URIs that are more complex than two levels. For example, customers, then orders, then products is three level deep. This level of complexity can be difficult to maintain and it will not be flexible if the relationship between resources will change in the future. Instead, we could provide two simpler URIs for the same requirement. Now it's time to sort the collection. For additional options or metadata, we can use query parameters. For instance, sort by price. Query parameters are recommended when we need to filter, sort, paginate, or when we need to pass additional properties or options to an operation. So in this case, the sort query parameter sorts the orders of a customer and then the limit parameter specifies that only the first 10 matches should be returned. To summarize, in this example, we use customer as a resource, then orders as a sub-resource, then we used query parameters to get further options on those resources. Returning plain text for a REST endpoint is not a good idea. When plain text is returned, Instead of a structured media type, the client application may have to do some extra parsing and processing to extract the data it needs. This can introduce errors and performance issues, which no one wants. We should always strive to use JSON, XML, or YAML to represent and transmit data. These media types provide a structured way of representing data and lets the client application easily parse and understand the data being returned. For REST APIs, you should prefer JSON if possible. JSON is widely supported in modern programming languages and frameworks better than XML or YAML. XML has pretty good support, however, it has unnecessary verbosity. So using XML can lead to larger file size, slower parsing, and increased bandwidth usage. YAML is the least verbose and is more expressive than JSON. However, it doesn't have the same compatibility across programming languages and systems as JSON. Finally, the API should allow the user to specify the content type header. For example, it can be set to the value application slash JSON. If a client sends data in JSON format, the server needs to know that it should parse the data as JSON before processing it. Or if the client specify an unsupported content type, the server can reject the request, preventing potential errors or security issues. So. Specifying the content type allows the client and the server to communicate efficiently and understand the format of the data being exchanged. Changing a REST API after it has been adopted by several clients is without a question one of the worst things we can possibly do. When we suddenly change the API, clients will find out the hard way that the API they've been using is not working anymore. So their code is broken, their applications are failing, and their users are probably angry. 
Clients have trusted your API to remain stable and predictable and you have betrayed that trust. Not cool. In this case, the clients will need to update the documentation, modify the client code and provide support to their clients who are struggling to adapt to the new API. And this should be done as soon as possible to make the clients work as before. In short, changing a REST API after it has been adopted by several clients is a recipe for disaster. So, unless you have a very good reason for doing so and a solid plan for managing the transition, you should never do it. However, web APIs ain't gonna stay the same forever. Business requirements change all the time, so you might need to add new stuff, change how stuff is related or tweak the structure of the data. So, how do we give the chance to client application to use new features and resources while making sure that the existing features work as before? One approach is to make the API backward compatible. For example, you might have an API that returns the product details and later you would need to include the price currency. Without breaking the parsing of existing clients, you can add an optional parameter, currency. This allows different clients to choose whether they need the new field and to specify the currency type. However, if we use many times this method, the end result will be a messy set of switches and codes required for each call. So, this might be an option, but only for quick and simple updates. However, the common way to update an API is by versioning. We can specify the version of the API in the URI by appending query parameters, by adding HTTP headers, or by specifying media types. But which one should we choose? Let's see the benefits and trade-offs. Considering the performance, the URI versioning and query string versioning are cache friendly. Usually, they refer to the same data each time when an URI or a query string combination is used. These two approaches are pretty common. However, from a RESTful perspective, the URL should not be different depending on the version when fetching the same data. So, for REST purists, we have the options to specify the version using a custom or an accept header. These are less intrusive since they don't change the URL. Ultimately, the choice of the API versioning depends on development team preferences. But normally, URI versioning are the easiest to understand and implement, while media type might be considered the purest of the versioning mechanism, which can also support HATIOS. When designing a REST API, we have to make sure we add solid exception handling. We don't want uncaught exceptions to slip and propagate to the client. For example, if a user makes a request for the user details, then the API might require to have the user ID as a number. Instead of throwing a generic error message and a status code of 500 for everything, we should let the user know exactly what is wrong. So, we should catch the exception and wrap it with a descriptive message and an appropriate HTTP status code. Here, it's really important to make sure that you're using the right status code for the situation. If you're confused about what status code to use, you can always check the status code definition page published by the standards organization IETF. Make sure that you distinguish between client-side errors and server-side errors. Client errors normally require the client to make some changes on the request, while server errors are the responsibility of the application to address and solve. This also makes it easier for the application to identify the real problems on the server by monitoring the 5xx errors. Finally, a pro tip is to make use of a global error handling strategy across the entire web API. This will improve the user experience by providing clear and consistent error messages. Also, using a global error handling approach can help to manage the complexity and makes the API more scalable. A global error handling approach can be reused across different API endpoints, reducing the amount of duplicate code needed to handle errors. The last level of REST API maturity is to use hypermedia or HATIOS. For example, to handle the relationship between an order and the customer, the representation of an order could include links that identify the available operation in that order that could be made by a customer. This principle is a way for the API to describe the state of the application and to provide links to the next available actions that can be performed by the user or client application. 
This principle sounds nice in theory because it provides a discoverable and self-descriptive API which allows the server to change the URIs without breaking clients. However, it has some major disadvantages. First, performance concerns. Including links to related resources and actions can increase the size of the API responses, which can impact the performance. This is especially true for APIs where many requests are made for the same resource, for instance, millions of requests. Including the links in such an example is a waste of resources. Second, there is a lack of standardization for this principle. Currently, there is no widely accepted standard for implementing ATS in REST APIs. Because of these reasons and others, this concept has a low adoption and remains more a theoretical principle and not usually put in practice. 